Hi, folks. Welcome. Uh, we'll get started in just a, few, just a moment. We're going to let a few other folks come in through the waiting room. All right, I think we can go ahead and, and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone's having a very nice week. I want to give a very big welcome to everyone for attending the LGBTQ plus lawyer and tax forums first virtual event. We're very excited to have a fireside chat with one of our distinguished advisory board members, Stevie Conlon. Uh, before we get into the event, I just wanted to let folks know about LLTF, our mission, a little bit what we're doing. So we are a pretty new affinity group for the ABA tax section. We were formed last fall, and our the goal of our community is to connect and empower uh, LGBTQ plus tax practitioners to be the best in their tax careers. And we hope to use our forum to help establish the ABA tax section as a leading voice for LGBTQ plus tax practitioners in the country. The three pillars of LOTF are community, mentorship and leadership. So all of our activities and everything we strive to do, both through virtual events and in-person events is geared toward those three pillars. Uh, for those who are not already members of LLTF and would like to learn more about the group and also get on our listserv, I just dropped a link into the chat. That'll take you to our main webpage where we post everything, all of our content. You can also sign up on the listserv there. And I think with that, I will turn it over to one of our board members, Grace Chang, who is going to lead the discussion with Stevie today. Grace, over to you. Thank you, Brandon. Hello, everybody. My name is Grace Chang. And um, like Brandon said, I'm a fellow board member. Um, and on behalf of everybody on the board, I am like, it is an honor to introduce Stevie as our speaker today. Um, Stevie is the VP of the Tax and Regulatory Council in at Walters Kluwer, and um, I could I could go on and on about her her bio, but that would take a whole a whole hour. So I'm just gonna like start asking Stevie questions, and and then we're gonna like d dive into her career and her and and basically her her journey and her experience as an esteemed tax attorney. Um, a little bit of housekeeping items though, we will have a QA session, but we're gonna have that at the end. If you have any questions, feel free to drop that in the chat right now uh, or like at, as they come, I will try to monitor them or you can also ask them at the, at the QA session at the, at the end. Um, okay, so Stevie. Let's start from the very beginning. When did you begin practicing law? So, Grace, I, I started practicing law in 1986 at Chapman and Cutler in Chicago. Uh, the firm was known for its national finance practice with a, the two areas were tax-exempt finance. It, it did tax-exempt bonds across the country. And it also did leverage leasing, primarily representing creditors across the country as well. In the Midwest, um, I um, that's where I'm, I grew up. And so I uh, went to law school at Loyola Law School in Chicago. Um, I did that at night while I was working full-time as a tax accountant for a little accounting firm at the time called Arthur Young. Uh, I'd gotten my undergraduate degree and my CPA in 82 and I, I wanted to do tax work while I was studying to be a, a lawyer. And the thing that I really, that really jumped out at me was the comparative size of the tax practices. Um, Arthur Young had 60 people in the tax department when I started. When I started at Chapman, it was 12. Um, I also decided when I started at Chapman to kind of focus on particular tax areas. That seemed to be the thing, so that's what I did. Yeah. You mentioned that you were studying to become a lawyer while you uh, while you were working as a CPA. So what made you decide to 
uh, to choose law as a career and particularly tax law? Well, m- my dad, my dad was a tax lawyer with the IRS. Um, when I was growing up, he was a litigator in the Milwaukee District Office of the IRS. And he had started as a IRS field agent in Chicago, um, you know, prob- probably about the time I was born. Um, when I became an attorney, he was regional counsel for the Midwest region and based out of Chicago. But was was kind of strange was after he retired from the IRS, he went to work for EY in Chicago. And that was strange because he worked and met all these people that I had worked with when I'd been at Arthur Young. Um, so that was kind of weird. The other thing that's sort of unusual is that when I was a kid, he would bring home uh, tax related court opinions that he was excited about for me to read. And so when I was little, I would read these tax opinions. And after we had dinner together, he's a lot of nights he would go back to work. And if he went back to work and I'd been good, I could go with, and I could, hang out in the law library while he worked and read anything I wanted in the law library. And that was kind of fun. At home, he kept uh, the tax, the standard federal tax reporter, which is one of the tax reporting services that probably a lot of people on this call are familiar with. And he kept that in, in a closet at home. And so that was always around the house too. Wow. Uh, I mean, that sort of reminds me, uh, my parents are both, accountants they're they're both accounting professors and i i made it a life's goal to never become an accountant because i don't want to i don't want to work with anybody that they've worked with but here i am working for a big four so um we all have different paths (laughs) um so in your career who have you admired professionally so first of all I have a I have a story. So when, when my daughter was a lice, I'll say, look, when you grow up, you're gonna be a you're gonna be a tax person like me. And she would all say, No, I'll never do it when I grow up. So of course, years later, she uh got her master's degree in accounting. Now she didn't practice, but uh it, you know, it's it's sort of funny, these stories. I I'm really enjo- I really enjoyed them. And I apologize, everybody. So going back to your question, Grace, about people I've admired, I would say that um uh, for for me, there are really too many to name. There are people that are standout, like, you know, um, I um, got to meet, um, uh, I got to meet Ken Gideon, who was um, both, you know, I mean, Ken Gideon was a pretty, uh, he was a great tax lawyer and he was very active in the ABA tax section. Um, I got to know Pam Olson. Pam Olson is great. Um and she was very active in the, te- she became uh, chair of the section. Um, and great la- lawyers that I've worked with have included Dale Collinson who passed away and Steve Rosenthal. Um, and then another person I met that that I really admire was Eddie Cohen, who was the, uh, uh, basically the tr- assistant treasury secretary for tax policy under Richard Nixon and was involved in the the Tax Reform Act of 1969. So, I've known some really cool people as tax pe- as tax people. That's I've been very lucky that way, Grace. Um, so it sounds like you like some of the name uh, the names you you listed. I've definitely seen them in like ABA um, like communications. So is that something like one of I guess. It, in a way, like, what are the benefits do you you see in participating like actively within the ABA and specifically the tax section? So, I've always found that the ABA tax section is really the best forum for knowledge development, transfer, and networking. If your practice is really a national tax practice, and I think that that's true, regardless of what whether your specialty is something like some of the stuff I do. Or whether you're a litigator, I think that it's a great way to connect with uh, tax people. Um, uh, you know, my advice would be if you're uh, if you want to be part of a network, get a, and, and you know get active in the ABA tax section. If you do if you do federal tax work, that'd be my 
number one thing to do. Um, so I hope that's helpful, but that's that's been my experience. And I actually met all those people generally um, in, in, you know, through the ABA tax section. Um, like what uh, what Brandon said in the very beginning, uh, the LLTF is a very new tax forum within the ABA tax section. Um, and so, Stevie, what are your goals with the LLTF and what what made you agree to becoming a, a member of our advisory board? Sure. I, I, I mean, I think that they really align nicely with the pillars that um, Brandon mentioned earlier. I'm very big on mentorship. I think that that's really important. You know, um, uh, it, it's sort of consistent with like, how will we leave the world tomorrow? I think mentorship is really important. And, and I'm really big on community. I think those would be my top two. Um, I, you know, uh, leadership is a good thing. Um, I think, you know, people lead through their, through, through doing what, you know, through their conduct. But I'm a huge believer in community and mentorship in particular. And I've always felt that way. So I'm really excited about the forum. Um, so because it's LGBTQ plus lawyers and it's, we're, we're doing this fireside chat to like, you know, hear about your experiences. We're going to have to start getting down to the nitty gritty. Um, sure. So I guess from the beginning, when did you first come out? So I, I came, so I started practicing laws, as you recall, in like 1986. And what I did was um, in the in the 90s, I started really exploring um, my own sense of identity. And um, I publicly came out completely in 2003, but in, back in 1996 um, and, and uh, or so, that's when I started started talking to my parents about it, and uh, people, I, you know, I had a relationship at the time, and I talked about it with the person I was in a relationship with, and um, th those first discussions were difficult, um, but that's when I started. So I started in 1996 with the process, and I really fully came out publicly in 2000, and, uh, basically in 2003. I change, you know, trans people, we, we change our names typically, or oftentimes uh, a lot of, uh, some people go on hormones um, and that sort of thing. And, and, you know, I, I changed my gender marker and my driver's license. I did all that stuff the year before I really came out fully. That was in 2002. Um, you know, the, the, legal field and um specifically like the tax world is like a small a uh, small community basically if you're in national tax federal tax realm like everybody know, like at least there's only two levels of separation between two people be between any other person um so what encouraged you and what caused you to come out um publicly so um i um I, I I don't think the other only I'm the only person that went through this grace. I, um, I I I I felt that I've been hiding my identity, and I and I um, really did a lot of thinking about about the cost of hiding my identity and the cost of coming out, and I was actually very. Um, you know, probably like everybody else in this call is kind of nerdy about it. And um, I really, uh, for a number of years, I sort of, I, I, I literally kept a journal for years, a daily journal to sort of work through it and, and, and sort of go through the process. I ultimately decided that the benefits of being open about myself were worth the costs, but the costs were high. I mean, um, you know, as we all know, and, a lot of people um, have trouble with work. A lot of people have trouble with relationships. And, you know, I've dealt with rejection. 
by people that I considered friends and professional colleagues for a number of years um, because of that small community that you mentioned, whether it's friends or whether it's work, um, th those things were difficult to work through, but um, I, had, I had decided it was uh, worth the effort. I also felt very lucky. So, and I know this is not true for everyone. Um, my parents were understanding. My, um, the person I was in a relationship with was understanding. My children were understanding. Um, and I found it, uh, a, an understanding employer, Walters Kluwer. So they've, and they've been supportive ever since. I've never had an issue. I've been there over tw almost 20 years. And I've always felt accepted and um, by, by the people I work with. It's, I really, um, th those things are, have meant a lot. I've also found people within our community, the tax community, that were accepting. And that was really important to me. Because again, you can probably tell when people are not accepting. You could probably read it in their face. But conversely, I could see that I that I really had a lot of allies that were like me. They were very serious tax professionals. And um, that was really important to me. I, I felt really good about that. Um, so you mentioned the support system and I would completely under, we all understand without a support system, without our support systems, it's really difficult for us to live our true selves. Um, so how was the transition for you? Like career wise, um, like physically, mentally, like, and, you know, just, just being able to live your true self, how was that transition like for you? Well, I mean, so I, I cannot, um, I, I, I do not want. I do not want to um, understate the costs of of, um, of coming out because I experience costs, and I think it's very true for for trans people. Some people might say, "Oh, what do you mean there were costs? I can't believe that that happened to you." But that's not the reality. I experienced costs. However, the benefits really were better. I. Um, I really um, uh, found the benefits of being out better. I had um, a number of people personally that were accepting. I, um, uh, Walter Sklor has been accepting, but the transition did involve cost. And as I mentioned before, I lost uh, friends and professional colleagues in the process. And um, it did give me a little bit of time, that transition, to get active in the Chicago uh, Pride community. And that was important to me at the time. I did a number of things in the in the gender, in, like Chicago Gender Society and Illinois Gender Advocates were two organizations that I, I chaired for a while. I got very active in participating in a float in the Chicago Pride Parade. I did that for 10 years. Um, so I did things that were a sense of community. It wasn't tax, but it, but it was, I think, important for me. And it, I think it's, um, I, I recommend those things for people that can do them. Yeah. Um, being able to find a community is, is so important. <laughs> um, like I definitely do find that you know could, because the tax world is just smaller, it's just harder to uh, ha harder to foster a, a community um, within. But um, I mean, and that's that's exactly what LLTF is striving to do. Um, so throughout your career, what have you noticed that changed um, in people's mindsets, uh, especially the acceptance towards the LGBTQ plus community, and what else could be done? Well, I, I mean, I think in large measure, it's the moment you're in and the time span you're looking at, okay? So I um, began my journey in the 90s 
I really came out fully in the early 2000s. And in general, since those times, I think a lot of things happened that made things better and more accepting for trans for trans people and LGBTQ people, LGBTQ plus people generally. I think that that's been the case. Um, but it's if people think it's going to be a straight line like this, it's just not. As we all know on this call, it's a series of ups and downs. And right now, there are there are things that suggest a lot of negativity, um, particularly at the at the state level. Can you can you still hear me? Okay. Yep. Good. A plus. All right. Um, so, I I think that. Um, you know, in the big, you have this sort of experience where things got better, you know, because again, I'll talk to some people that are younger and they'll say, what, what do you mean there was all this discrimination? I go, oh yeah, 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 there really, there really was. So I, I think that, you know, working through it, it's gotten better, but there are things that are very, that are very troubling and, and all I can do is, is do my part to help make it a better place along with all the other people that are active. Um, like I definitely, I didn't start joining the like professional field. I didn't start working until 2016. So I, I, I was always able to, um, to enter being fully out, uh, enter the work field full, being fully out, but fully but i'm fully understanding that without the fights that people before us have actually put like the efforts that people before us put in like i wouldn't have been able to to be, uh to enter the work fe work field workplace just free i guess um so through uh throughout your career because of all these um trying to be more intentional, trying to be more obvious and, uh, and raising awareness on the treatment of LGBTQ plus people in the professional field, in the events that you need to call somebody out um, or like in the, in the events that you need to confront, uh, confront other people, how do you artfully do that without burning bridges? Or um, I guess like, how, how do you, how do you do that without, also sacrificing a part of yourself? Uh, I think that that's really hard. I, um, I'm, I personally find it very difficult, Grace. I, I really wish I was better at it. Um, I found a workaround. And my workaround is, uh, I, I really focus on xenophobia, the idea that people have this sort of fear of what they don't know. And the way I try to make it, I, I try to get inside of that by demonstrating that it's worth knowing me. So uh, in the tax space, it might be by demonstrating that you, um, that your, that your tax is strong, you know, that sort of thing um, in, um, but it might be something else. It might be some other skill outside of tax in your personal life or in, 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 in an area of interest. Um, it's, um, that's the way I try to do it. Part of it is, is that, um, you know, we all deal with a lot of smart people in our community. And um, if they don't get it by now, I'm not sure they're going to, but I want to do everything I can to make it a better place for tomorrow. And um, I, I do get frustrated. I mean, so think about my own journey. I transitioned and went right back to the to the tax community I was always part of after I transitioned. Uh, and there were times when the when 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 certain people were not comfortable with it that um, really got inside of my skin. And then I turned to my support network to sort of lean on and work through it. And that was really good for me. So whether it was family or 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 my allies. Those things are, and that's why I think the the forum is so important because of of how it provides a sense of community for people. Uh, 
I mean, yeah, I, a lot of times, like if, if somebody, you know, uh, uses, um, like uses wrong pronouns or just treats people in a, um, not respectful way, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to, how to handle it or call them in or call them out. I just, a lot of times I just sort of like gloss it over, pretend I didn't hear it. And, um, but either way, it still hurts. And like being able to have a community you can lean on is so important in those, in those situations. Uh, Grace, I'd like to pick up on that for a minute. So I completely relate to that. Obviously, you know, in my gender transition, um, I made a conscious decision not to change my voice. I had done a lot of public speaking and I, I do some singing too. And I just didn't want to try to alter my voice, but it does cause a lot of people to sort of read me as a he rather than a she. And that hurts my feelings. It does. It makes me feel not accepted. And, um, I really do rely on my network to work it, work through it myself. So I completely understand that. Um, since we're in the uh, giving advice stage, what advice would you give to young people before they enter the workplace or um, before they enter uh, before they join a an organization? How do you? learn about the, uh, that organization's culture what types of ask questions should these people ask dur- uh, before um before joining or like during interviews how how do you um discern the culture of a specific organization before going in well um there are a couple of things that i would recommend and i'll get to those in a minute but as a, as at the outset um Let's start with this. I have conversations with people that tell me, and you could sort of get your own impression based on what I hear as they go like, well, these laws have been passed that provide for equality. Everything's equal, right? We're done. It's all fixed. And so I, I think that um, we have to start from the idea that, uh, that a, a sense of not belonging, a sense of discrimination, um, is still around in a lot of places. It hasn't ended. And, um, and I think that that's really not good for us and for the environments that we're in. So um, I, uh, I think anybody who um, is perceived as not um, some sort of stereotype um, has a, a certain element of risk, but particularly LGBTQ plus people have these concerns about, about will I be accepted? And, um, and will I, you know, be able to work and, and thrive in this situation? But there are basically three things that I uh, would, rec- would recommend. The first one is, uh, I would really start with, does the organization have support groups? Um, and, you know, but that's where, just where I'd start. I'd also sort of say like, are the support groups lip service or are they really meaningful? Um, and the second thing is, are there people in leadership roles that that look like, look like us, look like you or me. And, um, you know, or, or that you can tell is just an ally. Um, is there a dedicated um, staff, like for DEI or LGBTQ? Because that costs money. And businesses generally are very sensitive about spending money. So if, they, if, they're, if, they're, if they've got those things, it means it's important to them as a general matter because otherwise they wouldn't be spending the money on it. And the most important thing is really hard, but it's something that um, I think some of us learn the hard way, which is if you end up in an environment that feels hostile or uncomfortable, move on. 
you're better than that. And life is too short. And that's, that's a, a, that's a, a somewhat of a brutal message, but I think that that's really important because how we get along, you know, you don't want to be the person who comes home from working really hard every day, just wanting to, to, um, to cry or get upset because it was such a bad day because of the environment that you were in. Um, so those would be my recommendations, Grace. Yeah, that that's definitely, uh, that's very good advice. And I mean, the third one is <laughs> definitely speaks to a lot of, um, is speaking, it speaks to a lot of people, I think, but that is, some of the most difficult, like one of the most difficult things, because, you know, if, if you want to move on, you got to think about all these other, um, other factors. Um, and so like, it's easier said than done for sure. I agree. I, I'm not saying it's easy, you know, um, being, um, out can come with a lot of costs, as I mentioned, as we all know. And, um, but, um, but really, being unhappy versus being in a situation you enjoy. I think that's really important. So I guess um, sort of pivoting, then, what, then why? Um, so did you apply any of any of the, um, I guess, methods that I guess number one or number two in your search um, during your transition? Um, and, and how did you end up choosing Walter's Kluwer? Um, so I, um, I chose Walters Kluwer because it was an organization I was familiar with. Remember, I was growing up with the tax reporters in the family, in one of the closets at, out at the house. Right. And, um, I had remembered all the, 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 um, the texts and, and other volumes that we had, um, in the law library or at the accounting firm library at Arthur, Arthur Young. And um, I, um, I looked for things like, was it accepting? However, the other thing was, I, you have to remember, I was presenting as very out. And so I, you know, I was sort of putting it out there that, um, that this is who I, who I am. And um, I think that really helped me. Walter's Clore has been great because, again, I think that they recognize the importance of belonging and have demonstrated that. So that finding that culture, which exists in other organizations, many or other organizations, too, that's really important. And and I'm I, I think those are things that that's why I said every we should all look for it. Um. I think we can't, this is a wonderful opportunity and we can't, we can't um, not sort of give you the opportunity to basically share your thoughts on the recent attacks on trans people and specifically trans youth. Um, well, the, yeah, there are a couple of different things. So, so um, I, so first thing I would state is that attacks on trans people are not new. I mean, you know, I for a number of years, if we go back and I would talk about what I did when I was very active in the Chicago pride community and the trans community, um, we take, we recognize the day of remembrance in November for the trans victims of hate crimes. So you have all these trans people every year that basically are, are murdered because of their trans identity. Um, now we have sort of these um, state legislative trends to sort of restrict um, various activities by trans people. Um, and those are extremely distressing, extremely distressing. They feel very personal. I haven't, I haven't felt this attack, even though they're not directly aimed at me. I haven't felt this attack since I was, since I went back 20 years ago. It's, it's really distressing. Um, and, but what, when that happens to me, 
it sort of triggers my activism. Um, as uh, I don't believe in going away, Grace. And when my activism gets triggered, I get pretty stubborn. And I go like, I was a tax lawyer. You, you might tell me, and people have said to my face, they go like, oh, you should move somewhere else. You should move to a community that, um, that's, you know, that's, that's not as conservative as this, or you should move, um, or you should get into a different line of work. And I get triggered and I, I go, I'm not gonna move and I'm going to keep being a tax person. So that's how I sort of react to it. Um, I believe that we can all be great at what we do and still be our true selves. I think that I, I really do believe that. That's really important to me. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're, uh, your point about how like trans people has the, the the attacks on trans people has not like is not new is actually hit home because um, one of my former uh, roommates she's a nurse in one of the biggest hospitals here in DC and one time she came home telling me that she treated four trans people that were stabbed in like different part of different parts of DC and it 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 hurt um, just you know, uh, hearing how, uh, you know, violent and bigoted people can get uh, just because it's something that they're not familiar with. Um, and, and yeah, it, it really hurts. So um, at the end of the day, uh, what are some of the steps we can, we can take to stand up for one another and, and, and stand up for other people within the LGBTQ plus community. And even if you're not within the LGBTQ plus community, what can you do as an ally to basically make, um, make this world a better place? Well, um, I'm not alone in this, but I think that there's a lot of interconnectivity between different segments of a group like the LGBTQ plus community. I think the different segments. I, I think that there's a lot more interrelationship between our the segments of our community and um, sort of other communities that are not meeting the the, the stereotypical norm in that area. Um, I think there are a lot of connections. I believe in support across all those groups. I always have. Um, you know, let's talk about it. Um, People that attack me because I'm trans, are they really attacking me because I'm trans or because I'm part of the larger LGBTQ plus community? They might not even really understand what trans is. Um, I might be a rep an easy representation for them of the larger community or a different segment. And same thing, you know, if you're, attacking uh, this sort of person, what's the difference between this sort of person and that sort of person? So you can easily do this like with, with uh, the LGBT community and other groups like, you know, um, people that aren't in the majority religion in a place or they're not other things. I think you, you can see that there's a lot of connectivity. Um, my big thing to, to do would be to be active. I really do believe that. Um, and support others, support others meaningfully. So I've always thought, thought, thought of myself as an ambassador for the community to stand up and to help bit by bit change that xenophobia that I talked about before to sort of make the world a better place for all those people that will follow us. And that's what I try to do. So those would be my, my tips. Um, I, um, you know, the one thing I would mention is that um, finding a sense of acceptance where you work and with your friends and family, that's really important. I've seen 
a lot of cases where that's not the case. You probably have two, and that's heavy. I have a lot of personal heavy experiences that are very, very difficult with that. So finding that space, whether it's an accepting employer or um, whether it's a, um, um, you know, accepting community that you feel part of, those are really important things. Um, you need places where people really feel belong that they belong. It's important. Um, so I remember when we, uh, we first chatted during a prep call, I got on and the first question you asked me was, are you having fun? And so like the, the, the first question you asked of me was, was, are you having fun? And it kind of took me aback a because nobody's really asked me, no tax attorney has ever asked me if I'm having fun. And, um, I think that's such a, um, it's it's so like representative of who you are um, that you believe in wanting a, an environment that you can thrive in and that you're having fun in. So, what is your advice to achieve um, work life balance, or like your your definition of work life balance, and how do you keep having fun in this field? Yeah, I mean, I I don't want to um, sugarcoat things. I work very hard. I know all the people on this call do. I know you do. And, um, but I've, um, a lot of the things that we do, I'm not sure we would do them if we weren't having fun. I really don't. I mean, when you think about the long hours that a lot of us work or um, the other things we do, I'm not sure you'd really do them if you weren't having fun. Uh, but I did learn that that's always an important question. Uh, you need an, you need to be in an environment where you in, where you feel like you're having fun. And in a lot of cases, that's finding good work-life balance. We need some things that are different. We don't want to be monochromatic. I think that that's really not good for us to just be like all work, 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 or one thing. I think that we're better people with, with, with some variety. I really do. So I would say find an environment where you can achieve your work-life balance. The second one is I would say to make sure that you take the time for life and you're honest about the activities you want to do in your personal time. You have to do that. Nobody else will do it. In other words, if I'm that person who says, I'll stay at work and keep working on the work I can do, then it's sort of my fault if all I'm about is work. So you really have to, you have to drive and do the other things. What you enjoy might be different than what I enjoy, and that's cool. That's really cool. But you have to engage in those things. I, I talked about this a lot with people that we are who we are based on taking d definite steps to do the things we want to do. I think you have to do that. And then the third thing is, is I think that you should spend time with those that ex those people that accept you and you care about. Um, I often say that you know you have to water relationships like you water your plants. You have to really invest the time and effort with people that care about you and your network, whatever your community is, it's important. So those would be my three things, work-life balance, making sure you actually do the, the life balance stuff, and then uh, invest. Um, so with the, like, <laughs> keeping relationships like you're um, watering a plant. I think that um, in my head, I was like, uh-oh, because I'm very notorious for killing plants. So I'm hoping that I'm better with relationships with other people. <laughs> um, so in our last 10 minutes, uh, what are what are some of the um, aspects, other aspects of your legal career or your personal life? Would you like to Would you like to talk about? And after that, we'll go right into QA. 
uh, the the other things that I do. So I have I have things I really enjoy that are super nerdy. I love to read. I love to listen to music. Um, but I'm also very active. I I play music in a rock band, and that is also a way to sort of get out in the broader community um, and try to connect and just sort of demonstrate that you can you can be different, but you can still you know, you're, you're no different than anyone else. There really should be a sense of belonging. It's important. And uh, that's what I sort of do. But on the work side, going back to your question, Grace, I, um, as you know, I like to do a lot of uh, speaking and writing in addition to doing tax work. And um, I, uh, many years ago, probably... I think, I mean, it, it probably 20 years ago, I was at an ABA tax section meeting in um, down in Texas. And I sat next to somebody and they said, wow, I really um, appreciated that article that you did on this, you know, some arc, I, I typically write grace about arcane tax issues. And um, they said, wow, you wrote this article in 1993 and I had this project and I really liked it. It was a great way to get for me to get started in the area. And I like that sort of thing. I like that, you know, through the um, the writing that I've done or the speaking, I can help people get in, in, engaged in an area. I do think that, you know, the two things I would caution everybody about is you need to write and speak about things in general that are new. Uh, that are of interest and um, that, you know, where, you, where you're really connecting with people. Some people, um, you know, can think through all the rules, but they might have some trouble expressing it. Those three things I think are really important. I think as a writer, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do things to write, I do it to help our community. And um, it, it felt really good to have somebody say that. And uh, the other thing I'd say is be, th be careful. Don't overwrite. Don't overcommit to speak. You know, you don't want to be going like, I can't take time for myself and do the activities that you and Brandon were mentioning. I can't do this because I'm so busy do honoring some commitment that not quite work, but feels like it. So those are that's what I sort of do on the work side, but um, I um, I like the diversity of the activities that I do, and I like the balance of what I do. It's been fun. Awesome. Well, um, th th thank you so much, Stevie. Oh, where? probably opening it up to anybody who has questions or not even questions, just comments. Um, if you want to just go off, off mute. So Stevie, it's Eileen Marshall. Um, I just, Hi, Eileen. Hey, how are you? Good. I just wanted to say that when I became involved in the American Bar Association, um, I felt very much like an outsider and you made me feel very welcome. And so that's one of the things that Stevie has really done as part of the bar community is for everyone. You know, I'm sitting next to her at a, at a FIP, you know, um, segment and somebody says, let's go out for a beer. And Stevie says, Hey, I heard this really great band is playing. And we wound up going to listen to a band. It was just like, an amazing experience because this kind of luminary in the financial product space was like inviting me in. And I felt very lucky to have had that experience. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Eileen. I, I, yeah, you know, I mean, I just try to be me and I, I would say that it's always been a pleasure with all the stuff I've ever done with you. I wouldn't change a bit of it. So thank you. Uh, I had a, a quick question. Um, sure. I'm a parent of a one-year-old and a three-year-old, and my 
partner and I are trying hard to be mindful about um, creating space for our kids to express themselves as they continue to age. And I wanted to know, not just uh, from UC, but from the group as well, if there was anything at home that you experienced that either really helped or really hindered um, your development as an individual. I'm trying to not make some of the mistakes my parents made. I, um, I, I, I can't think of anything. Well, here's what I'd say. I, like probably many people on this call, I felt incredibly alone growing up. I really did. I felt like nobody, nobody else was like me. And, you know, the environment I grew up in, um, um, religion was a big deal for my family. And so um, I thought the consequence of me having these feelings was um, very adverse for my afterlife. It was that, that simple. Um, and it wasn't until in the 90s that I sort of realized that I wasn't the only person on the planet like myself. And um, it's sort of funny because, um, you know, every, everyone, um, a lot of people go through a similar experience like that, but I can't think of anything particular about the way I was raised. I felt very fortunate as I, as I, as I inferred before, I felt fortunate because my parents were accepting when I ultimately came out. And yet I, I, I know, unfortunately, a lot of people that that was not the case for. So I, I would just say, in reacting to your question, I can't think of anything specific environmentally, but, um, you know, having a, a fundamental um, position of acceptance um, and making sure that your kids know that, that's, that I would start with that. That'd be my, sort of my quick thought about that. Um, but I suspect you're already long on your way on that one. Uh, I hope so. I, my partner and I, the, the philosophy we try and adopt for now, and again, one-year-old and a three-year-old, uh, we're just trying to cabin the tantrums, but, uh, you know, we just try and refrain from ever saying, you know, you don't do that. You know, you, you don't play with that or you don't do that because you are blank. You know, we just try and create space to let, let them explore whatever they want to explore. That, I mean, having an environment like that is, is great. Um, it reminds me of the sorts of environments that you might have um, in, um, in, in various um, learning environments later on as a kid. So it, it sounds super cool. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so we're at time, but if anybody else have any questions, you can feel free to email um, email us. Or Stevie, or, are you are you willing to put down your uh, your email address on, on the chat? Um, and we will have a diff a different. Um, we will have further events coming coming up and so and you'll get the information for those events as well on the lift serve if you're if you're on the list serve um that said i'm hoping that i get to meet 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 you all in person at the next aba events and if not and i hope to see you guys again soon at our next event